Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you for that introduction. And uh, well, I first started thinking about this uh, problem when uh, Akshay asked me a question about one of Frank's papers with uh, Matt Emerton. So it's it's really uh, a great pleasure to speak at this conference organized by those two people. Um, so, um, so right, I want to talk about the rank of Mazur's Eisenstein ideal. So uh, I'll start by uh, reminding us what was the situation uh, Mazur was thinking about. So, so in this story, we have p, p is a prime, and n is also another prime. Uh, so we use the letter capital N because that will be the level, but we're only specifically talking about uh, prime level. Uh, so <coughs> Mazur was interested in congruences between Eisenstein idea or Eisenstein series and and cusp form. So here we mean the Eisenstein series uh, e to n of uh, weight two and level level n. This is a, the, an Eisenstein series, and um, the constant term of this Eisenstein series, uh, well, the constant term of Eisenstein series usually looks like zeta of uh, 1 minus k. So in, in that case, it's, in this case, it's minus 1. But here, since we're, we're talking about level n, we have to remove the Euler factor at n. So uh, concretely, this just means the number uh, n minus 1 over 12. So uh, so if, if p divides n minus 1 over 12, then mod p, this Eisenstein series, looks like it has uh, no constant term. So it looks like a, a cusp form mod p. Uh, and you can ask whether there actually is a cusp form uh, that's congruent to it uh, mod p. So, uh, so the question is, so is there? Uh, congruence uh, might be when uh, p divides. Okay, uh, we're, we're here. Uh, this one is a cusp form. So, so that's the basic question. So to formulate that more precisely, uh, let me introduce some notation. So, um, so here we're going to let uh, i be the annihilator uh, in some heck algebra, which I'll call h, of this Eisenstein series. So h here is the heck algebra of weight 2 and level n. Um, so this is the, the Eisenstein ideal. Uh, and we want to call t the completion of that Hecke algebra at the maximal ideal generated by i and p. So we should sort of think of this guy as the, the Hecke algebra for form, modular forms that are congruent to the, this Eisenstein series. Uh, so we also, you can take the quotient of this, which I'll call t0, which is just you restrict to the cusp forms. So this is the cuspital. Okay, um, and inside these Hecke algebras, I'm also just by abuse of notation going to use the same letter i for the image of i in here, and i zero is the image of i in here. Okay, so we should think that this t zero is like the Hecke algebra that acts on these forms f that are congruent to the Eisenstein series. So in particular, if there, there are some forms like that, this Hecke algebra should be non-zero. And if there are no forms like that, then this Hecke algebra should be zero. So, so Mazur proved the following theorem that tells us the structure of that algebra t, t naught. 
Uh, so the theorem is, so there's an isomorphism uh, T naught So this Hecke algebra just looks like a power series in one variable mod a single uh, equation. Uh, and this equation, this guy is a distinguished, distinguished polynomial. Uh, so meaning it's, it's a monic polynomial, and, and all of the, the lesser degree terms are divisible by p. Uh, and moreover, the, the the constant term of f, if you look at its p-adic valuation, it's the same as the p-adic valuation of n minus 1 over 12. Uh, and moreover, so what is this element y doing? y, under this isomorphism, maps to a generator of i So the content of the theorem is mostly that the, this uh, Hecke algebra, or that the, the Eisenstein ideal is, is principal once you, you go to this localization. Um, and it tells you the, also the index of the Eisenstein ideal. Uh, so OK, but particularly, uh, so if, if this constant term uh, is a unit, then this, this ring is 0. So in particular, uh, uh, t is non-zero if and only if p divides n minus 1 over 12. So it, it's saying there, there is a cusp form congruent to Eisenstein series uh, if and only if p divides n minus 1 over 12. Okay. So this, this theorem is I exactly what Mazur uh, needed to know in order to prove uh, his famous theorem uh, classifying the possible torsion subgroups of uh, mortal vague groups of elliptic curves. Um, but there are still several questions uh, left open about this. So, um, so for example, you could ask, what does this polynomial f look like? So, so question. OK, so, so two questions I hope to, to address in this talk are sort of what, what does f look like? So what is the, the Newton polygon So th this polynomial f I'm writing here, this is not, not really a canonical thing. It depends on a choice of the generator of Eisenstein ideal. But the Newton polygon of f is uh, independent of that choice. Um, so th that, in particular, tells you things like the Newton polygon will tell you things like, what is the degree? Uh, and the degree tells you, what is the rank? So a sub-question sub is, uh, what is Um, and uh, another question is, um, what uh, what happens uh, for and composite? So here we use the the letter n for the prime, I guess, in a suggestive way that maybe there should be a similar theory for when n is is not prime, just a composite number. So OK, so um, right. So I'm going to try to address, uh, well, address the first question and, and then make so, some comments about work in progress on the second question. So, uh, so the first question, I want to give some examples that can that sort of tell you what, what is this M Newton polygon uh, saying about um, modular forms. So in these examples, I'm always going to take p to be 5, for simplicity. 
Um, so I'm going to take p is 5, and I'm going to take various n. So when n is 11, uh, this, the cusp forms of weight 2 uh, and level 11, it, this is, is spanned Expand by a single form f, and it looks like uh, q minus 2q squared minus q, and so on. Um, but see, you can see for at least for these first two ones that, um, and p divides uh, al f minus L minus 1. So if you take the, uh, you take the L's Fourier coefficient of f and you subtract the L's Fourier coefficient of the Eisenstein series, it's always divisible by, uh, by p. So this is for all. Uh, so what that's telling us, that the fact that there's one form uh, and that it's really p that's dividing this uh, is saying, uh, in terms of that f, this is saying that f uh, is linear. Okay. So another, in other words, since this is a linear polynomial, that's just saying that t naught is isomorphic to zp in this case. Um, and this is this is what usually happens. Where here usually means uh, my guess, guess it happens uh, p minus 1 over p of the time. And have, have uh, f minus. So if you, you choose a, a, a random prime n that's 1, one mod p, I would guess that the, this happens to be linear p minus 1 over p at the time, so ba based on a bunch of computations. Um, so it usually happens, but that's not what always happens. <coughs> so um, when n is 31, uh, s to 31 is, is spanned by, by uh, this guy, which you can write uh, and, and it's and it's gala conjugate. So there, there are two forms, and, and this guy and its, its Galois conjugate span the whole space. And what you find is that for, uh, if you let uh, currently p be the prime ideal above 5, um, in this ramified uh, DVR, then this curly p divides ALF minus L minus 1 for all, L not equal 11. So um, in this case, the fact that this, there's, there's one form and the P uh, is ramified of degree 2, that's saying that the F is, is irreducible quadratic. Thirty-one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, so in both of these two examples, there are actually very few, very few modular forms, and all of them are are Eisenstein. So to give you a more, and that, that's kind of unusual. So to give a more usual example, or take uh, n to be seven hundred fifty-one. So th this already, you can tell, may be more interesting because 
Uh, 5 divides 750 a lot of times, more, more than just once. Um, so in this case, the, the dimension of S2n is 62. And there are, there are two Gala orbits. Say f and g. Um, I'm not going to write them down, but they're well. The coefficient fields have uh, dimensions 24 and uh, 38. And for uh, for f, there are three three primes p in O f above uh, p, but uh, none of them none of them divide. Uh, these a l f's. Minus L minus 1. So there are three primes above P, but uh, none of them are Eisenstein. Um, P is 5 still, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, and here uh, there are five primes P above uh, P, but for and 2. Two unramified ones. Uh, divide. So in this case, there are two two different primes. Uh, so this G is kind of Eisenstein in two different ways and in two different unramified ways. So this is saying that. Um, in this case, the f is reducible quadratic. OK? Um, and so to give one, the biggest example, or the most interesting example, you take n to be 3,001. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it'll look. Like yeah, it looks like two copies of Z five. Yeah. Five cubed. Yeah. So the in this case the Newton polygons sort of looks like a p cubed and then one and then like this. So there's uh uh what am I saying? Yeah. The rank here the rank is two, but the one slope uh. Is big and one's like this. Okay. Um, right. So the, the the constant term has a valuation p. Is what I'm saying. I mean the, the coefficient of y has con. What are the residue degrees of these primes? What are the residue degrees? I think the, these two. I I think these two are both. Uh, uh yeah. Yeah, yeah, residue degree one. Yeah. Um Okay, so finally I'm not gonna say all of this stuff for, for this one because every, all the numbers are very big, but the the final answer is that F uh has has uh Irreducible factors of degree uh, three, two, and one. So, the, in this case, f has so the the rank of the Tech algebra is six, and the, it splits as as three different things. And uh, right, so this is sort of the most most interesting case that I, I found in my computations. Um, OK, so, so the question now, 
So I guess the, the, the point of Mazur's question maybe is uh, how can we tell, uh, or what is it about these different primes that, uh, or is there some arithmetic reason why we see these different behaviors? So most of the time we see this behavior where the f is linear, and, but this 31 is something special where it gets higher dimension, and, and this is, is something special where it, it splits, and this is something where it splits into to bigger things. And so the question is, where, is there some uh, arithmetic reason for uh, these different examples? So that's, that's what we want to try to answer. OK, so the, right. OK, so, uh, right, for the, so what I'm going to focus on for the, the rest of this talk is I'm mostly going to talk about this uh, question about what is the rank rather than what is the, the Newton polygon, just uh, for simplicity. So, uh, um, OK, right, so the rank. OK, so uh, for, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume that p is actually bigger than 3, um, and, and that p divides n minus 1. So p being 2 or 3 is uh, an interesting thing because of that 12 that appears in the denominator. But the, so the cases of cases of equal 2 and 3 are uh, studied by, by Caligari. Well, uh, they also studied uh, all primes, but in particular, they gave a complete answer for p equals 2. So, so you assume now that n is prime, right? Yeah, still n is prime. Um, right. <coughs> um, right. OK. So. So to describe the rank of this t, uh, I want to describe it in terms of some uh, algebraic number theory uh, data. And to do this, I'm going to express the, the answer in terms of something about Galois cohomology. So I want to describe three, three classes, that Galois cohomology classes, that, that show up. So I call them a, b, and c. So a, So A lives in this kind of Galois cohomology. Uh, B has uh, one twist coefficients, and C has minus one twist coefficients. Um, so here, so with trivial coefficients, this just means um, an unramified outside N and P extension of Q that has uh, degree, the Galois extension of degree p. So for this, so this class, we can describe it by describing that extension. And we're going to take, it corresponds to the, the degree p subextension uh, theta n p of q zeta n over q. So this, this is an extension of degree n minus 1, and p divides n minus 1, so there's a degree p subextension. And here, this b, th this Galois cohomology group is described by Coomer theory, uh, and b, b corresponds to the Coomer, Coomer class of n, the prime n. And this c is something, um, something less explicit, but it's de determined up to a scalar by the fact that when you restrict to the uh, decomposition group at uh, Q, QP, uh, it's trivial. So this is a class that splits completely at P. OK, so I have, have these three classes. Um, So the, the names of these classes may seem funny, but um, so really, so they're called ABC because you should think of them as being organized as a matrix of cocycles 
a, b, c, and minus a in the Galois cohomology of this kind of um, <coughs> adjoint representation. So th this should should seem more uh, reasonable because th this uh, this thing, this representation, that's the the residual representation of the Eisenstein series. So l looking at a class in the, the uh, Galois cohomology of the adjoint of that thing should have something to do with deforming uh, Eisenstein series. OK, so here is the, the theorem. Um, so the first part of the theorem is that the, the rank for Zp t0 is greater than or equal to 2 if and only if a cup c equals 0. This is the cup product. And that's if and only if b cup c equals 0, and also if and only if m cup m equals 0. So all of those things are equivalent. And the, so I write it in this way that the rank is bigger than 2, uh, because here you can see that there's a 2, two here, and there are two things we're cupping together. And the, the, the general result is that um, the rank is bigger than or equal to k. So this is for, for any. Any k, if and only if the massy product of m with itself k times uh, is zero. So this is the massy product. Um, so I'm not going to say define too carefully what the massy product is, but uh, hopefully, I will say something that will make it uh, clear what the definition should be. So, just just one thing that when k is two, the twofold Massey product is just the cup product. So, thi this uh, k equals two case, when you put k equals two into this one, you re recover this one. Okay, and just to say something about how how do you get in, instead of the rank, how do you get something about the Newton polygon? You can notice that. All of these classes here, which I defined um, mod p, you could also define them mod p to the r, where r is the highest power of p, uh, p to the r is the highest power dividing n minus 1. Uh, and then the, you can count the, rather than counting the rank, you can count the valuations of that polynomial f in terms of how, how high do these things vanish mod p higher and higher p powers. Um, so the, the valuations of those coefficients are determined by the valuation of the Massey product, p adic valuation of Massey product in some sense. Uh, I don't want to say too much, but um, OK. So right. So in this first result about counting when, when is the rank bigger than 2, or or conversely, or another way of saying this is when is the rank exactly 1, there were some previous results about that. And I want to explain why this result uh, recovers those previous results. So uh, OK, so I'm going to say cup product and class cube. OK, so, so here is a lemma that uh, b cup c, if b cup c equals 0, then that implies the class group of the Coomer extension given by n. You take that class group and you look at its p torsion. This thing is not cyclic. Um, and similarly, the class group OK. 
So, so it's saying that these, these things that appear in the, the main theorem actually have some, there's some interesting global, er, they have some interesting global arithmetic to them. They're saying something about class groups, which is it's interesting. So I just want to sketch the proof of this, which will hopefully help to explain why, what massy products are. Um, so the first thing is, is why, why are we asking about non-cyclic? Um, well, the, the first thing is that there's some genus extension of this field that implies already that it's non-trivial. So gen genus theory says, genus theory says that these class groups are non-trivial. Um, so our job is to, so there's some obvious class in here, and our, our job is, is when b cup c, we have to find some non-obvious class. So when, when b find uh, non another class. Yeah. OK? Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, b cup c, you can think of the cup product as being an obstruction to building representations. So what do I mean? b cup c equaling 0 is equivalent to the, the existence of a representation that looks like, uh, like this, has a Okay, so so the the content of this is that this uh, you can fill in this corner phi um, exactly when b cup c equals zero, uh, and that's easy to see if if you just write down a formula like, like like this and write down the condition of what does it mean for a matrix like this to to be a representation, you'll see that the the d of phi has to be equal to b cup c. No, this is just a this is just a Galois cohomology. Uh, this uh, we don't make any restriction, but um, right. So then the point is that uh, so when when you you take such a matrix, if you take phi and you restrict it to the Galois group of of this Kummer extension, remember that B B was the Kummer class of N, so when you restrict to this, this uh, subgroup, you kill the b. And that makes phi into a, actually a, a co-cycle, or a, in this case, a, really a homomorphism. So this thing gives you this homomorphism. Uh, this, this is actually a homomorphism. And, and that's what gives you your extra extension. So you, you, you have to do some work. So check. Uh, it can be made. So it's sort of. I think huh. There is some restriction, right? I mean, the p needs to be unramified outside. Right, right. So you, uh, right. So there's still something to do. You, there's not a unique choice of such phi, so you have to to choose it in such a way that it's unram. It's sort of automatically unramified at n, and uh, you have to check that you can choose it to be unramified at p too. But th this is just the idea, not not a real proof. Uh, so. And the, the case of A cup C is, is very similar. Um, OK, so why, what is that? So if you think about cup products in this way as being an obstruction, uh, Massey product is sort of the natural generalization of cup product. So uh, in this lemma, the cup product, so cup product, which equals Second Massey product, Massey product is a, an obstruction to gluing uh, two, two by two matrices to uh, 
three by three matrix. So just just like there, we had those two 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 by two matrices given by B and C, and we want to know if we can glue them together to get a three by three matrix. And the higher cup products uh, or higher Massey products, the so third Massey is the obstruction to gluing to three by three matrices to a four by four, and so on. Okay. So Massey products always live in H2. Uh, Massey products of any number of uh, H1 classes always live in H2. Yeah, so they're, they have, uh, yeah, they have negative graded degree, if you like. OK. Um, great. So if you combine this lemma, if you combine this lemma with the theorem, you get a result about uh, the rank of the class group being related, or the, the rank of the Heck algebra being related to the class group. And this was the, the result of, of Caligari Emerton. I first proved that Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so this theorem is like, yeah, I shouldn't say for any k. I should say if, if you assume that the rank is at least uh, k minus 1, then the kth Massey power is defined, and it's 0 if and only if the rank is, is 1 bigger. So it's sort of an inductive thing. Thank you. So Caligari Emerton first proved this, this, uh, this result, which is a corollary of, of the theorem and the lemma. And but we also get another corollary about uh, this other type of class group uh, being related to the rank. OK, so, so the, these cut products are related to class groups, but now I want to say they're also related to zeta values. OK, so, so what uh, zeta function am I talking about? Well, we had this uh, zeta n of minus 1, which is n minus 1 over 12, which is 0 mod, mod p. So we have this, this zeta function that's vanishing in some sense. And we want to understand uh, how can we, so if you have a zeta function that vanishes, you want to know like what is the order of vanishing in some sense. But we have to formulate that in the right way. So here, instead of thinking about the order of vanishing at, at minus 1, we want to think about the order of vanishing uh, in a different sense. So you, you can think of this uh, zeta function with the Euler factor removed as being the, the Dirichlet L function at minus 1 of the trivial character mod n. And so what, what we want to do is consider, so we know uh, this Dirichlet L function vanishes at, at the trivial character, and we want to consider the order of vanishing as we vary the character. Um, so we consider the function, uh, the function which sends a character, this is a Dirichlet character mod n, to the value of the Dirichlet L function at minus 1 mod p. So th this function, uh, the function on characters with values in fp, so we can think of it as an element of fp uh, as an element of this group ring. So let me call that, that element uh, zeta. Zeta is this element. So then the fact that it vanishes at the trivial character is saying that this uh, the fact that that zeta value or that this uh, l minus one of the trivial character is zero uh, is telling us that uh, 
implies that zeta is actually in the augmentation ideal of that, that uh, algebra. And we can define the order of vanishing of zeta in the sense of uh, Maser Tate to be the maximum r such that zeta is in the rth power of the augmentation idea. So, mm, so then there's a proposition that um, uh, this order of vanishing is greater than or equal to 2, again, if and only if this a cup c is 0, and also if and only if b cup c equals 0. Okay, so, and this proposition I should say is this is not, this is not using the modular forms or anything, this is a purely uh, algebraic number theory thing. So, uh, this is uh, related to, so proof, proof is, is like the proof of Stickelberger's theorem. And this is related to to work of, of Le Couturier, uh, who's here, and also Schaefer and Schaefer and Stubbly, uh, are also here, um, and also an unpublished work of. of Calgary and Emerton. OK, so, uh, so I, sh I should say that the, it's not, so, so if you combine this proposition together with the theorem, you get that the, the rank is at least 2 if and only if the order of vanishing is at least 2. Um, but it, it's not true in general, not true in general that that the rank of t is bigger than k if and only if or data is bigger than k. But it is, so the theorem says it's true for, for 2. And we conjectured that it's true for k equals 3. Uh, and this was proved by Emmanuel. So th that's maybe what the subject of the next talk will be about. But in general, it's not true. They, one, one can, can be bigger than the other. They're not the same number. So one can be bigger than the other, and the other one can be bigger than the one. As soon as they get bigger than two, they can be uh, just completely different numbers. OK. But OK, so why, uh, why, OK. So one other thing I should say is that this So there's a fact uh, the fact that this order of vanishing is bigger than or equal to 2 if and only if the following number i to the i over uh, n minus 1 over 2 uh, is a pth power uh, mod n. So I'm going to call this number m sub n. And here m is for, for uh, Merel. Um, so no, no, this fact was first told to me by, by Akshay, uh, but maybe it was first proven by Emmanuel. I, I don't know who this, who this is <coughs> due to. But um, 
So why, why is that interesting? Because uh, there's a theorem of Morel from 1996 that the, the rank is long if and only if this mn is a piece power. Uh, it's not not p power. right. The rank is one. Uh, so uh, and so we give a new proof of this theorem by combining this fact with the proposition and the theorem, um, and it's a completely different proof. The Marel's proof had to do with uh, modular symbols and and uh, the Jacobian and so on, uh, where our proof is sort of purely uh, algebraic. So it's surprising. Um, OK, so that's really all I wanted to say about the rank of the Eisenstein ideal. So uh, I'm going to go on now to talk about composite level. Uh, maybe it's a nice time to ask if anyone has a question. Okay. What's that? The second part. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I haven't really said anything about the proof of the first part either. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, right. So I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about the proof, but you, you can ask me uh, later. Uh, I don't know a good reason. Uh, well, you mean, so there's sort of an elementary reason why why these two cup products vanish at the same time, which I guess explains why those two things are simultaneously non-cyclic. The point is that, what's that? They don't have to be Yeah, they don't have to be. But uh, we just know that just this one-way implication, that if, if one, one of those cup products vanishes, right. So th this isn't an if and only if. So I guess we don't know that the ranks of those two class groups are the same. But uh, we just get. Uh, one way implication that if one of those cup products vanishes, then the other one does. Yeah. Uh, just yes, assume the implication is in fact an equivalence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The second one is actually an equivalent. That's true. Uh, but uh, you have to do something more than just this lemma to prove that. Well, why, why is it clear that two cup products vanish? Oh, yeah. So the, the reason is that uh, you can reduce this global cup product vanishing to a cup product just at the prime n. And when, when you do that, um, it turns out that A, A and B, uh, for some trivial reason, A cup B is always 0. So A, A and B always lie in the same line uh, when you think about them as n cohomology. Uh, and so these two things are kind of the same. Yeah. OK. Um, right. So now I'm going to move on to talk about the composite case. And uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about the square-free case. So I, I want, uh, these are distinct primes. So now, one complication is that uh, there isn't just one Eisenstein series of weight 2 anymore. There are lots of them. So there are 2 to the r minus 1. Uh, Eisenstein series. Um, and you can label them by uh, by epsilon in plus or minus 1 to the r minus uh, this thing. Uh, and how are they labeled? Uh, well, the, the epsilonist Eisenstein series, when you act on it by the ith atkin lehner involution, you get the ith coordinate of this plus or minus 1 vector. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm labeling them as, as uh, uh, eigenvectors for the atkin laner involution. So this is. Okay. Um, and when you, you take, if you look at the constant term of one of these Eisenstein series, uh, it looks like 1 over 12 times <laughs> looks like this. So, so right, this is, this is interesting if uh, if um, L i is congruent to minus epsilon i mod p. So now you, uh, there's already this sort of interesting new phenomenon that um, in the prime level case, you only care about prime levels that are 1 mod p. You only get Eisenstein congruences uh, for those things. But here you're allowed to take epsilon to be, so in that case, you're only allowed to take epsilon to be minus 1. Uh, and in, in this case, you're allowed to choose some of the, the epsilons to be plus 1, and you're therefore interested in primes that are also minus 1 uh, mod p. So, OK. Right. So, <coughs> so now we can make the, OK. So I want to specifically talk about that case. So. where I'm going to take epsilon to be the, the choice of signs where you get as many ones as possible. So you're only, you have to have at least one minus one. And I'm going to say that's the first one. And then I'm going to choose the rest to be plus ones. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to keep the same notation. But now i is going to be the, the annihilator of this Eisenstein series. And t is going to be the completion and so on. Uh, but I, an important point is that here, when, when I talk about this Hecke algebra H, it's now important to say which Hecke algebra I'm talking about. I want to I take the, the commutative Hecke algebra that contains the atkin laner involutions for the Ls. I don't want to take the, the UL operators at primes dividing n. Um, that makes a difference. Um, in some cases. OK. So in this case, we prove the following theorem. Uh, so this theorem is, is more an analog of, the, of Mazur's theorem that I stated at the start of the talk, describing what is the structure of the, the Heck algebra. Um, so in this case, the what we can say is that the Hecke algebra is a uh, Gorenstein, or it's even LCI. And there's a short exact sequence. Uh, like this, okay. So we can. So what does the short exact sequence say? It's telling us uh, we have this this Gorenstein algebra, and now in Mazur's case, the the Eisenstein ideal was always principal. T. Yeah, T. T is Gorenstein. I'm going to mention what about T zero. Um, T and but in this case, it's 
It's not because it's, it's monogenic uh, over ZP. Actually, the Eisenstein ideal may have lots of generators. So uh, here, I mean, these, these things are only interesting when the Ls are congruent to minus 1 mod P. And here, this one, only if L is 1 mod P. I want to take the the t all the the usual operators at the unramified places, and I want to take the atkin laner involution at the ramified places. Hmm? Minus the sign. Oh, in the ideal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in, in, he was asking about in the Heck algebra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Heck algebra. So the, the, then, by, because of this. Annihilator, th those elements will be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So, so in fact, um, so I should make some remarks about this theorem. So, So actually, we, we can tell there's also a part about uh, plus, plus we, we know when it splits. So there's some kind of algebraic number theory condition of, under which it splits. So we can actually count exactly what are the number of generators of so the Eisenstein ideal. What is the nature of that condition? It's something about whether some prime uh, splits in some extension. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is, if you're not familiar with this Gorenz, word Gorenstein, uh, one way to think about it is that this Hecke algebra is Gorenstein is saying if and only if, when you take the modular forms of weight two and level n, and you tensor this this algebra, you you take the Eisenstein part, this is free of rank 1 uh, over t, so as a t module. Or another less obvious way of saying it is that when you take the cusp forms and you tensor t naught, you get i naught as t module. So those three conditions are equivalent. And this maybe answers uh, uh, Jack's question, which is, um, so, and uh, there's also t, t naught is Gorenstein. So the, the both algebras are Gorenstein if and only if the uh, the Eisenstein ideal is principal. So in these cases, what we're seeing is that the, the full Hecke algebra acting on all modular forms is Gorenstein, but usually the Eisenstein ideal is not principal, and so the other algebra is not um, is uh, because of this thing. Th this guy is not cyclic as a Hecke uh, module, so it can't be free of rank one. Uh, and th this is related to, to the failure of multiplicity one. One in these cases. So this this was studied by Ribbit uh, and uh, his student Yu. So. This Gorenstein condition is also related in some way to, to multiplicity one. And the fact that this t naught is not Gorenstein is saying that fit you get a failure of multiplicity one uh, for a particular uh, lattice. But this t is Gorenstein is saying you can take another lattice that's more natural for this big t, and you'll get multiplicity one. Or the, I mean, I just take, take the Eisenstein completion, kind of. Uh, that, take the Eisenstein part. OK, um, and maybe I should say one more, 
more result, and then I can can start. Uh, so, so right, everything is very nice in this um, in this sort of new case about the signs being plus one, but the case where you have more than one sign being minus one is very much more complicated. So I just want to say something about the case where you have two primes and you have the signs both being minus one. So here's the theorem. So assume uh, assume that both of the primes you take are one mod p, and neither one. Uh, is a piece power mod the other. It's a bit of a strange sounding condition. But uh, if you assume that, then uh, T is Gorenstein. And uh, I not mod I not squared is just Zp mod L1 minus 1 Zp. And, and so So in this case, uh, again, if you assume L, L i are one, bo both of the two primes are one mod p, and they're not a piece power mod the other, then the, the full Heck algebra is Gorenstein, but the smaller Heck, the cuspidal one is not, because the, the Eisenstein ideal is never principal. It always has exactly two generators. Um, so right, so we have this strange condition, and, and that's not just a, something about the proof. You, basically, any example you take where this condition fails of neither one being a piece power mod the other, the Heck algebra is not Gorenstein in those cases. So uh, it's really a, uh, right. So uh, right. So some new ideas are needed to, to, to understand these non-Gorenstein uh, things. So I'll stop here.